One of the most important issues in the contemporary security environment is that of weapons of mass destruction, or WMD. And, and we just don't want to talk about weapons of mass destruction. We want to talk about them in connection with this idea of how you can use force and the threat of force for some political purpose. So we don't want to lose this idea, right, that, that force is used as part of negotiation and that it's done for political purposes. Uh, so last time we talked about how force is powerful but costly. And so one of the strategic questions you, every country wants is to be able to uh, reduce the cost to you to prepare and inflict damage while raising the cost that you can impose on your adversary. And what better uh, for that purpose than nuclear weapons, which for the amount of destruction they cause, and especially for the amount of fear they cause, are fairly inexpensive uh, things. Or in other words, lots of bang for the buck. And that is where that expression comes from. Uh, so the nuclear revolution, um, it didn't happen all at once. Um, although when the United States dropped uh, nuclear weapons on Japan in 1945, people immediately perceived that this was a game changer. Uh, but really, it was a, a two-step game changer because a nuclear war in, in the 1940s, there were very few nuclear weapons. The, the U.S. basically dropped the two that it had. So the numbers were small, and they relied on airplanes um, to drop them. And of course, airplanes had limited range, and they could be shot down, and so on. Uh, the other big part of the revolution was the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which we call ICBMs, in the 1960s. Um, the combination of those two things large numbers of nuclear weapons and large numbers of missiles um, means that for the Soviet Union and the U.S. in particular during the Cold War, we could, in the space of a half an hour, uh, uh, drop several thousand nuclear warheads on each other, right? Each of those warheads are sufficient to destroy a decent-sized city. And by the way, um, the, the destructive capacity of a large hydrogen bomb exceeded that of a Hiroshima uh, atom bomb by even more so than the ratio that the Hiroshima atom bomb exceeded the conventional weapons of the time. Um, in other words, uh, the bombs themselves got much, much, much more powerful. So what are the political effects of nuclear weapons? Well, uh, we could go through this in gory detail. Uh, people write whole books about this, but I'm going to boil it down to this. They seem to be highly effective at, deter at deterrence. Nobody wants to attack a country with nuclear weapons because you're afraid that they might nuke you. The much, much trickier thing is whether you can use them to coerce. It's one thing to say, if you attack me, I'm going to nuke you. It's another thing to say, please do what I ask, or I'm going to nuke you. And for whatever reason, um, that threat does not seem to be especially credible. Interestingly enough, not only is it not credible when you're threatening to nuke a state that could nuke you back, but it's not even been very credible um, the, the, when you're threatening to nuke a non-nuclear armed country. So, for example, the fact that the United States had nuclear weapons didn't really seem to phase uh, the Vietnamese uh, or the Iraqis or the Afghanis very much when we were fighting them. They basically were... So the, the idea was it's a different thing. And as long as we stay conventional, it's not credible the idea that they'll use nuclear weapons, and so far that's proven to be the case. That being the case, uh, we they, we want to ask the question: Then who wants nuclear weapons, right? What can you? If you can't really use them to coerce people, you can only use them to deter. Who wants them, and why? Uh, well, before we get to that, we need to uh, get at another thing that kind of results from nuclear weapons. Um, well, actually, let me go back. Let me go. Back. Who wants to get nuclear weapons and why? Let me just answer that uh, succinctly. Um, the answer is, if you don't really want to attack anybody, but you do want to deter somebody, nuclear weapons are just the ticket. And so it's not too surprising that the countries that want nuclear weapons are countries that are worried about being attacked. Uh, it's Iran. It's North Korea. Right Before that, it was Pakistan, Iraq. Why? Each of those countries had somebody out there for North Korea and for, the, and for Iran, it's the United States. Uh, for Iraq, it was the United States. For, for Pakistan, it was India. 
Each of those uh, countries had somebody that they thought, number one, might attack them, um, and number two, that they could not compete with in terms of conventional weapons, right? So if you're up against a country where you know that if it's a conventional warfare war, you're going to lose, nuclear weapons seem like a good option. Okay, um, so let's go on to mutual assured destruction. This is a situation that arose between the United States and the Soviet Union. And it was, it was based on a couple of things. One is huge numbers of nuclear weapons. And the other was a diverse uh, variety of ways to store and hide your nuclear weapons. We had some on airplanes. We had some in silos, uh, hardened by concrete, all over the United States and all over the Soviet Union. We had some on submarines deep beneath the Arctic ice cap, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the situation then is, even if the Soviet Union got off a surprise attack on the United States, completely caught us when we weren't ready, enough nuclear weapons were going to survive for us to be able to ruin their day, right? So if you've got 10,000 nuclear weapons, what that means is if, if you're left with a percent of them after an attack, that's 100 nuclear weapons, right? And so if we think about, oh, well, the, the, you know, the United States is going to blow up 100 Soviet cities, or, uh, the 100 biggest ones, or, or vice versa, that the Soviets are going to blow up uh, the 100 biggest American cities, right, doesn't seem like a very good deal. The point being that when there is no conceivable benefit of a first strike, the situation is highly stable. And that was the situation in the Cold War after the mid-60s or so. And so while this jokingly was called mad because it seemed like it was crazy, it actually was highly rational in the sense that we got to a situation where there was very little incentive for anybody to start a nuclear war. Now, this gets to a, a, a different question of why does the U.S. oppose nuclear proliferation if it can be so stabilizing? Well, part of, there's, there's really two reasons. One is um, there's a fear that some of the countries that might get nuclear weapons aren't going to be quite as stable with them as the United States and Soviet Union were, or the United States and Russia are today, or France or the U.K. or others. Um, and part of that is the idea that there are some countries that are very hostile and might do something irrational. Part of it is that in some of these places, the governments are quite unstable. And so there could be a coup. Uh, so they could sell the, somebody could try to sell the weapons to a terrorist group. There's all these, this, this notion of loose nukes that, that, um, that only the most stable governments are really responsible enough to handle these things. Now, others are going to say that that's completely ethnocentric. But there's a completely different view that says the United States... Um, opposes nuclear proliferation because when others have nuclear weapons, um, that means we can't attack them anymore. And it's not that we want to go and attack everybody in the world, but we certainly want a position where we can discourage them from doing things that we don't like. And, and to the extent that nuclear weapons give you impunity uh, because the United States or some other country can't attack you, it then makes it easier for you to do things that annoy the great powers. And so again, it's not coincidental that it's countries like Iran and, uh, and North Korea that want nuclear weapons because they want the freedom to stick their thumbs in the eyes of the United States and the West. Now, having talked about the beauties of mutual assured destruction, um, what I want to point out is that that only happens when there's lots and lots of weapons. Um, when there are very small numbers... In fact, a first strike can become very tempting. And this is what is famously called the use them or lose them dilemma. Right? You think about it, if you've got 10 nuclear weapons and they've got 10 nuclear weapons, and especially if some of those nuclear weapons are stored in the same place, whoever goes first might potentially be able to knock out all of the other side's nuclear weapons by only firing two or three of their own. Now they're disarmed, you've got nuclear weapons, and you can dictate terms to them. Right? In this kind of situation, the great nuclear strategist Thomas Schelling uh, sort of imagined a leader during a crisis thinking like this. He thinks that we think that he thinks that we think, and so on, right? He thinks that we think he'll attack. So he thinks we shall attack. So he will attack. So we have to attack, right? And you sort of get this self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, almost like the way that World War I started, except infinitely more destructive. And that's the problem when there are very small numbers of nuclear weapons. And so one of the real ironies, and, and I've said this before, and people don't like it when I say it, but it's really ironic, which is that once a country like, like uh, North Korea um, gets 10 nuclear weapons or so, 
is a really interesting question as to whether you're not better off with them having 50 or 100 or 1,000 uh, because th they are be much less tempted to sh uh, shoot them off during a crisis if they've got more of them than if they've got few of them. And that is pretty counterintuitive. Uh, that almost makes my head hurt. Similarly, however, there's a very paradoxical problem with missile defense. The United States has spent a ton of money trying to build uh, defenses against incoming uh, missiles. Besides the fact that technically it's incredibly difficult to do, um, it also can lead to some paradoxical and negative effects on stability, which is um, to the extent that it perfectly uh, can absolutely reliably knock out every single missile coming in, well then great, it negates other people's offensive capabilities, it makes the United States safer, and it makes those other countries uh, you know, less able to use their nuclear deterrence against us. However, if it works poorly, it can exacerbate the use them or lose them problem, right? Because now, say a country's got 100 or 1,000 nuclear weapons, and it knows that if it shoots them all off first, and it shoots 1,000 of them off, maybe 50 of them are going to get through. But if the United States goes first and wipes out most of them, and now they've only got 50 left, well, then maybe only one or two of them gets through. So the idea, again, is that uh, if, if you don't think your nuclear weapons can sustain an attack from the other side, you have this incentive to shoot them off first. And, you, and, and again, you get back to the use them or lose them problem. So missile defense, if it works perfectly, it can be a wonderful thing. If it works imperfectly, it can uh, create this instability problem. Okay. And that's a, a strategic problem to grapple. Um, I do want to briefly say something about non-nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Um, there are other kinds of weapons of mass destruction besides nuclear weapons, and I've listed them here. They're listed in the textbook. But I want to make a point about all of them. Um, while we call all of these things weapons of mass destruction, as it turns out, they're not really comparable to nuclear weapons. Why? Because um, in the case of biological and chemical weapons, they're not. Uh, you can um, build lots of them, but it takes massive, massive capacity to deliver them as weapons of mass destruction. In other words, if you want to deploy biological weapons to a large area, you need lots of planes and lots of missiles to do so. Um, and of course, it's very expensive um, to do that. Um, and in fact, they, they don't work very well as weapons of, of mass destruction because they tend to just blow away in the air. Um, Radiological weapons are a little bit more difficult. These are things that are called dirty bombs, which use nuclear materials like plutonium. Plutonium is one of the most poisonous substances known to uh, human beings. Um, and so it's the idea that you would uh, deploy a bomb in which it blows up a bunch of this stuff so that the poison is everywhere, even if you don't have the technology to turn the plutonium into a nuclear weapon. Um, so that, but again, how you deploy that to military benefit, how poisoning a wide swath of land and slowly poisoning people over hundreds of years, uh, it's hard to see how that's military beneficial. That kind of weapon, a so-called dirty bomb, is attractive primarily to terrorists who simply want to cause destruction for the sake of destruction. Uh, similarly, a metro electromagnetic pulse. There's a, some great movie scenes involving electromagnetic pulse, but in the real planet that we live on, at least so far, um, in order to get any significant electromagnetic pulse effect, you need to detonate a nuclear weapon. And so at that point, you're using um, nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe at some point, somebody will invent a better EMP weapon in the future, but so far, it's not the case. Um, the crucial political effect of weapons of mass destruction is, is this, is that for all of human history up until 1945, right, um, deterrence and defense were essentially the same thing. The best way to deter a war was to be able to fight a war. And what nuclear weapons did um, is they separated out the ability to deter a war uh, from being able to fight a war. Because nuclear weapons, in some important respects, aren't useful for fighting a war, or they can be in some circumstances. Um, but it's a way to deter a conflict without ever having to defeat the other side's army on the field. Right? You're not talking about defeating the, the, the Soviet army in Central Europe. You're simply saying, if you overrun us in Central Europe, goodbye Moscow, goodbye Leningrad, and, and so on. And, and essentially they're saying the same things to us. So it's, um, it's really changed the relationship between uh, force and politics. 